Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Celtic View podcast. We're here on another week and it's the start of a week where Celtic have won at the weekend again. So it's, it makes our jobs a whole lot easier when we come in here to the, the podcast. We've got lots to get into this week. We've got an exclusive interview with Mikel Lustig, who you may have also uh, when he came out at half time during the game against Hibs, he was back in Glasgow over the weekend for the first time properly since he left the football club. And he sat down with us before the weekend's game against Hibs to go back all through his whole Celtic career. So we've got that to come up later on. So definitely stay tuned for it, as well as a debrief on all the the weekend's action. Um, as ever, joined by our Celtic View editor Paul Cuddy. Hey, Paul, how are you? Very good. Well, you kind of summed up the weekend perfectly, so it was another good weekend for us. It was indeed. And we've got this sitting in front of us properly now, Paul. Last week we had a, a just a paper copy, and now we've got the full thing, the brand new Celtic View, which came out in stores on Friday on St Patrick's Day, which was perfect timing because it's a magazine which celebrates our Irish roots. It looks good, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's just, as I said last week, it's a you know, it's, it's celebrating various things, um, the League Cup final success, so we've got plenty of reaction from that, a couple of in-depth interviews with the manager and the captain, celebrating our Irish roots, and I think just, I think in the current climate, just maybe just a wee reminder, although Celtic fans know that, of where we come from and, and how we should never forget that, you know, we're all the, we're all the children of immigrants, refugees and asylum seekers, and, and that's, that's an important message to be reminded of. And then also just a, I guess a general Celtic celebration. So there's there's loads of stuff in there for everybody and the chance to win tickets to the, the Derby game here um, at the start of April as well, which is yeah, there is, a big game. There's plenty involved in the magazine, plenty of interviews and competitions and quizzes and all sorts. And they're just open up there. The celebrations, of course, the, the League Cup final victory and that Glasgow Derby back in February, so it was a good chance to go back over all of that and get some of the, the players and the managers' reaction to it and their thoughts. So if you've not got your copy already, then it is available in all Celtic stores and it's available online as well. And there's a, there's a special offer. Yeah, there's a special offer if you're shopping uh, on the official Celtic online store. If you spend over £65, then you'll a free Celtic view which is worth five ninety nine is automatically added to your basket. So that's just an extra wee bonus if you're already on there buying uh, various Celtic presents for yourself or for your loved ones. Yeah, definitely. So if you've not got your copy, you know where to get your copy now. And it's a chance to read the brilliant work of all of us. All of us, <laughs> yeah, and the Celtic View team. So what better way to, what better reason than not to, to get it than, than for that to read our work. Uh, Paul, let's get into the, the weekend's action then. Uh, Celtic 3, Hibs 1 on Saturday at Celtic Park. Um, it was a little bit more nervy than some of our home games of late. We still got the job done and it was another good afternoon's work on Saturday but we were made to work for it just that little bit more. Yeah, I thought the manager's post-match description of it being a bit chaotic. There was a lot going on. There was no rhythm to the game. Obviously, we lost Rayo Hatati very early on, which obviously meant it was an enforced substitution for us. There was the early sending off. There was some bad decisions, some penalties. So I think the rhythm maybe didn't, you know, didn't come as quickly. Although again, even in the first half, although we were one 0 down at half time, I think the only reason that was that happened was because David Marshall had produced a couple of mm. fantastic saves in the first half. He had a great game, but then I think the second half. You know, we got the early penalty, and you know, I don't think anybody doubted that the points were going to be secure. Um, but yeah, it was it was a uh, it was a wee bit different. I I, I didn't feel so much nervous because I, I still felt that it was going to come. And you know, when when a team's playing against us with eleven, they have everybody behind the ball. But even more so with Hibs, they just basically encamped in their penalty area because they had the ten men and something to hold on to. So I think the result was inevitable. The flow to the game wasn't helped by the fact that players and our coaching staff on the Hibs side were throwing balls onto the park as well at some points in, in the game. It was a wee bit childish. I mean, it was interesting, obviously, Lee Johnson get booked for that. I don't think he wasn't the one that threw the ball onto the no. the pitch, but obviously he the, the referee's punishing he him. He actually was pointing at who it was. <laughs> wasn't it? Like, uh, it was it wasn't very, me. It was, it was which it. is very poor. But um, yeah. No, I think he just had to take overall responsibility for the behaviour. 
I think there was probably a frustration there because, you know, they know how difficult it is. They'd got the lead and they were just trying to disrupt Celtic and the flow of the game. And you see it particularly from any time the ball goes out of play or behind Joe Hart's goal. The ball boys that's the play an integral part of getting the, the ball back to the Celtic players to, to get the game going quickly. And I think the problem with that one is a couple of minutes earlier, the referee spoke to David Marshall, who kind of, it was a corner for us, and then he kind of rolled another ball onto the pitch, just again, just to try and slow the play up. Yeah, there was actually, there was a fan in the front row who, when the, that ball got thrown on, was standing up and <laughs> giving it to, <laughs> to, to Johnson. And uh, he kind of turned around and he was like, Come on, like it's, it's part of the game, it's part of the game. Uh, it was having a bit back, but yeah, I wasn't too sure about it. Um, but let's get into, should we get into VAR to begin with? May as well. And we'll get it over and done <laughs> with and then we can talk about some of the goals. Um, now, obviously, can, the decisions in the game, uh, Carl Starfelt concedes a penalty, Hibs have a man sent off. We get our own penalty as well, which I don't think there's any debate over whatsoever. We had a bit of debate on Saturday after the game because I didn't think it was a penalty. Now, in retrospect and looking back at it properly, I do think in the letter of the law, it is a penalty. However, I just still don't like the fact that in football you're getting penalties for things that are so soft nowadays for something like that. But I do get it probably was a penalty. I mean, I think that's the, we're obviously living in the VAR era, so players are conscious now that Whatever happens in the penalty area is going to be retrospectively looked at. I always look at it and think, well, the difficulty is when you look at it first of all and you say, well, if that had been the other end, we'd have been screaming for a penalty. It, it, for me, it is a penalty. And I think the problem with VAR is that it's still, these things are still open to interpretation. And so there's still this feeling that sometimes, if would we have got the penalty at the other mm. end? Well, obviously we did get the penalty in the second half. So I think there's always that inconsistency that you know sometimes it's open to the interpretation, interpretation of the referee or the VAR referee. In isolation, I think once they have a look at it, and we were Peter Grant and I were doing the Celtic TV commentary and we had a look at it, and I think once we started seeing the replays, I, I think the I think it was the the correct decision. Uh -huh. I didn't get a proper look at it when I was at when I was watching the game. I kind of got some little clips or some freeze frame images and things. But see the thing with VAR, right? And for me, I was, I'm more of an advocate for it than I'm against it. But it's really, really taken my enjoyment out of being at the match. If you feel like you need to go to the game and have like a second screen with you at all times just so you know what's going on. Like I'm speaking to people sitting around me, we're sitting in the press box, you're speaking to journalists, far more than you ever did before because you're, you're just saying to people like, oh, did you see what happened there? That's, like, and that's you... one of the downsides so far. That well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just want to sit there in peace and quiet and get on with my Do you know what work. I think the part of the problem is, again, and uh, speaking to my wife who was at the game, just watching the game, and she said the frustration for, for supporters mm. that are sitting watching it is there's no communication. No. So when things have been checked, so we had the advantage uh, in the commentary of knowing that there was going to be a check and we were seeing the replays of the incident before Hibs got the penalty. But there's no communication in the stadium of even there is a bar check, what they're checking for. Obviously, they're not going to show the incident again, but I think they need to let, there needs to be better communication. It won't make people happier depending on what the outcome is, but at least if people know, because there's just that sense of, because sometimes you know that there's a penalty incident, but then they have to wait until the ball goes out of play, which may be 30 seconds, maybe a minute, and then suddenly the referee stops the play, so people are presuming he's checking it for something, but they don't know what. So I, I think communication it needs to improve, certainly. 100%, because we were all sitting there and we had no idea what was going on, because for the penalty that Hibs get, there was an offside flag that goes up, obviously, after the incident. So... Everyone was just sitting confused. There was no one telling you at all that the VER was checking. And I think that's because the communication didn't come through from Clydesdale House that they were actually checking something. Just the whole thing. And even the the, the, the bad penalty, which obviously wasn't a penalty, and VER did work there. The referee runs over to the monitor and starts checking, and then it comes through the communication. Yeah. So it's just leaving fans that are actually at the ground. And again, I think in, in football in general, we take for granted so much the fact that we have 60,000 fans that turn up every week and pay their money. You have fans at clubs around the country. You know, Scotland in general is the highest average attendances out of any league in Europe. 
and a lot of times fans are taken for granted and they need to get the experience better for fans with VR. I think the problem is that if you look at other leagues that are further on in terms of having introduced VAR, then they're still going to have these, unfortunately, they're still going to have these problems. It's, it's part of, you know, modern technology has been implemented into the game, but it is that you, you can sort of celebrate a goal, but then you're waiting to see whether it is going to be given or, you know, a team celebrating and then it's ruled out. And, and I think that's just unfortunate. That's yeah, the nature. Yeah. I, I thought by and large, I thought it was funny again, the, the manager's comments after the game, because obviously the Hibs manager was moaning about a lot of stuff and I think our manager was asked about it and he did say he, he knows all about Lee Johnson's views on it because he'd heard them for 95, 100 minutes which obviously uh, you know my sympathies are with him but because <laughs> he's one of these managers that he you know less is more I think is the, the advice but I thought by and large the only the only incident I think that, that Hibs for me would could have any cause to to grumble would have been the sending off for the for the second yellow card. I, I, you know, apart from that, I think our penalty was a penalty. Theirs was a penalty. The Abada one, VAR did its job and, and ruled it out as a penalty. That that is the only instant I, I thought they had cause for, mm. you know, legitimate complaint. It was just a poor weekend in general for VAR across Scottish football. I mean, the, did you see the one in the St Johnson Kilmarnock game? Oh, do you know it was interesting? I was watching. Uh, Rangers TV on Saturday night, I mean, sorry, sports scene on Saturday night, and um, they didn't have a lot to say about uh, some of the controversial incidents at, at Motherwell, surprisingly enough, um, but they had a lot to say about the incidents at, at Celtic Park, and, you know, I think a lot of clubs, um, you know, Hibs, Motherwell, you know, I suppose, were, you know, there was a lot of clubs that grumbles about, uh, about VAR in mm -hmm. Scottish football, not all of them, obviously, but... Um, yeah, there was, it wasn't the, the finest weekend and again, normally the difficulty is it's interpretation. So uh, the referee sees or doesn't see an instant and the VAR referee, he then maybe interprets, t interprets it one way and the, the referee goes and sees. And I, I, up to this point, maybe at the weekend, I'm thinking, right, well, technology in terms of offsides, you, you know, you, you kind of have faith because you're just drawing, it's just the machine draws a line and that's it. But, you know, obviously that that, that's now been questioned as well, so... Mm. Extra thick lines, eh? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, at least, you know, I, I know when we played at Fir Park, I think the, the photograph, of the, the release of Jota's disallowed goal, I think it was taken from a house in Hamilton. Yeah, so there's improvements, you know, so, yes. things, are, things are going <laughs> in the right direction. Uh, did you see the one in the St Johnson game, the handball? Where Constantine's literally thrown his arm up and pretty much slapped the ball, and you could see the camera pans to him after, and he's just standing there, and he's like, he knows it's going to be given, and then... Nothing at all. It was baffling. But anyway, uh, let's go into the actual football in the game um, on Saturday and the goals. I loved O's goal. Eight, nine or eight minutes left to go. And the, the thing I love about it so much is he misses a couple of kind of half chances beforehand, but he's not put off by it at all. He's got that desire and that hunger more than anybody else in the box. He, oh, he creates the space for himself when you watch it back. Cause he darts one way, makes the defender go that way. He then comes round the other way. And it's just, I love a header that's got so much power. It's bullied into the back of the net. It was like a Hart, John Hartson header or something like that. It was brilliant. I'm so happy for him as well that he's come off the bench and made an impact like that. Yeah, I, I also think he's a player that we're probably not going to see the best of him until next season. He's only just joined. He's still getting used to, to the way we train, the way we play. But he's coming on and he's making an impact. But, you know, the manager, when he signed him, was you know very enthusiastic about what he can bring to the team. You can tell he's, he's loving it here already. And if he can come on and make that sort of impact. And I think, you know, the longer he's with us, I think the, the more that he will, he will make an impact. But again, it was kind of the substitutes, you know, did really well and they came on. Um, I thought Haksibanovic just playing in that midfield role, you know, we, more often than not we see him out wide, but I thought when he play, came on, he was finding all these wee pockets of space and was linking up the play and I thought he looked really dangerous just playing off. Oh, um, I got a, another great goal, so he had a great game. I thought Alistair Johnson was excellent as well, um, up and down, you know, the, the right wing. So, you know, again, it was, they just had to dig in a wee bit and find a different way to win, but... But this is the quality of this team because at the end of the first half, I thought there was maybe just a little bit 
too much because the game was so disjointed maybe a little bit too much emotion going in we were putting balls into the box there was nobody there really to get in the end of it but then you come into the second half and it's they've just got that ability to reset and go right okay we're in control here we know what we need to do and they managed to do it whereas you know potentially other teams might have that might have been a game where they might have just been cursing their luck and thinking oh gosh like everything's went against us here and they don't see it out but this team just comes in at half time goes right okay we're in control we'll come out the second half we'll get the job done um, which was which was amazing Haksabanovic as well another player that you just mentioned he keeps coming off the bench and making an impact and it was interesting because I was speaking to him last week for the match day programme and he was talking about he was talking about his journey as a footballer which it's an incredible journey, what he's been through so far. A 23-year-old, he's had trials at Man City, Chelsea, Liverpool. Um, I can't remember if it was Arsenal in there as well. Played with like Rashford and Trent and all these players at that, that young age group. Then comes to West Ham, goes to Russia. And it's been an amazing, it's been a, an interesting career so far. He's got so much quality though. He's got so, so much quality. And I think, again, he's another one maybe next season we'll, we'll actually maybe see the best of. Yeah, I think he's I think he's one of the ones that's been unlucky this season because, you know, we were starting to see the best of him then he got an injury as well. Um, but again, he's another player that the manager can call on and whether he, he plays out wide, he makes an impact. And as I see, I, I was really impressed with him when he came on in that midfield, just in, in the heart of midfield at the weekend. I thought Jota had a, a great game as well. It's funny, like, you know, it's not going to be you know the greatest ever penalty. But when they, I always think uh, there's only one, there's only a, a bad penalty. It's only a bad penalty if, it, if you miss. If you score, then that's fine, and that's mm-hmm. we did. And I think it helped that we got that really early in the second half. I mean, we should have been ahead. Marshall had a couple of great saves. Mm-hmm. Starfelt hit the bar in the first half, so we could have been ahead by half time. But getting that early penalty to put us level, and you could see in Jota immediately racing back to the halfway line to get the team going again, and. And I thought he looked really dangerous at the, at the weekend. How many against last night? Nine? Nine? Yeah. Yeah. Getting getting closer. Getting, close. getting closer. Just need to keep chalking off the wins nine, now. Nine league games and two cup ties. Exactly, yes. It's uh, it's looking like a, it's going to be an exciting last part of the season when we come out of this international break. There's going to be lots of exciting games to look forward to. Um, but yeah, international break this weekend. So... No Celtic action for us to look forward to. Um, in terms of other action at the weekend, uh, the B team kicked off on Friday night, uh, playing at home against Spartans, who are top of the table in the Lone League. And they got a 91st minute equaliser in that game. I think Darren sounded quite pleased with the, the boys at the, the end of that match. And again, for them, there's they've not got many league games left at all, but they're still in the fight to potentially finished top of the table. Yeah, and I think that was a, a real challenge for them on Friday because I think, you know, when we spoke about um, the benefits of the Lone League and one of that is playing against, you know, teams that are, you know, can be very physical because it's a very young Celtic team that we've got and I think Spartans are one of those teams that one of their great strengths is their physicality and they got an early goal but, you know, I think Celtic more than matched them and I think it would have been un- unlucky in the boys if we had managed to get a late goal and I think as well, just the fact, what they've been encouraging is just the fact that at no time did the heads go down, they just kept going and, and to get in the kind of great Celtic traditions, getting an, an injury time goal would have been a, a great boost for them. And what Dan was saying after in his post-match, quite similar almost to the first team game where Spartans, they go a goal on front and then they just try and completely take the sting out of the game and kind of getting up to all sorts of antics to try and stop Celtic from going on the attack but he was so proud of the players that they managed to stay calm and just stick to the football that they know how to play because they know they'll get results from it and then the 91st minute they get their just rewards. Yeah I think to be fair I think the Spartans are a really a difficult team to beat I think you know we've found it difficult because they they are very tough and you know whether they're hitting you on the counter attack whether they're digging in you know using their physicality so that's a that's a challenge because I say some of some of our players are only 16, 17. So that that in itself, you know, you could think that may be quite intimidating. But you know, they certainly they more than merited the the, the draw. Yeah, well, it looks like Spartans are probably even if we finish first or if Rangers finish first, but we're sitting ahead of them at the moment. 
obviously neither of those teams can then go into the, the playoffs. So it looks like Spartans are going to be the team that goes into the playoffs. And they've got a good structure there as a football club, really kind of forward thinking. And again, they could be a team that's playing in League Two next season. So uh, it's a good opportunity for the Celtic players, as you mentioned, in terms of the, the programme they've had this year. But again, international break for them, so no games this weekend. Um, and then on Sunday, it was the Scottish Cup for the women's team for Fran Alonso's side. Again, another game where Celtic team go a goal behind, but then they completely power through away from home against Hearts, which has been a difficult venue for most teams this season. And they scored five goals in the second half, which is very impressive. Yeah, it's the kind of classic game of two halves. And I, th I think, again, losing, we lost an early goal. We had a few chances in the first half and didn't you know, manage to take them. The manager made a couple of changes at half time. I think both of the substitutes went on to score. So obviously just getting the chance to bring the team in at half time and just change a, a, a couple of wee things. And, and we got an early goal to get back in level terms. And you know the fact that we are the cup holders, a really difficult uh, draw in the semi-final against Glasgow City, who we beat in the final last season. So. Um, and I think the big incentive this season is that both the semi-finals and the final of the, the Scottish Cup, the Women's Scottish Cup, are at Hamden, which I think is a is real progress. It's a real step forward to let you know these players to be playing on that stage. Um, the other semi-final, I think, is Motherwell versus Rangers. So it's a, it's a game that you know we're still in the hunt for the, the league title, but again, we want to hold on to this cup and to be playing at Hamden as well. And when that comes around. You know, that's a game that you're, you know, you're looking for a fair few Celtic fans to go along and cheer them on. Yeah, 100%. And the women's team's next game is next Monday night. And it's the first game of the new split in the women's team. So obviously similar to our split. However, the teams will play each other twice instead of just one. So they'll have, they've got 10 games left in the season. And it starts off with a game away to Rangers. So it's quite an exciting end to the season where you know you're going to be having these big games you mentioned Glasgow City in the Cup you're going to have some more games in the Derby you're going to have some more games against Glasgow City so everything is still to be played for Yeah and that first game I mean obviously the last game against Rangers we hammered them 3-0 so there'll be a real edge to that because you know they'll, they'll be looking for revenge and I think if we if we can win that game then that kind of I think that more or less, it really makes it difficult for Rangers to try and retain the title. But we need to also keep you know, in, in touch with Glasgow City because they're six points ahead. But there's still all the teams, those three teams have still got to play each other twice, as you say. So a lot can still happen. And I think it, I think it also helps when you've got so many big games like that, that the team has to be on it every week. And that will help, I think, also going into the Scottish Cup semi-final because there will not be any games where you know, they don't take any team for granted, but obviously there's, there's weaker teams in the league but the bottom six, they're all playing each other. So I think every game is going to be, you know, highly competitive. Yeah, and if they can stick in at it, I think the last game of the season, Glasgow City play Rangers. So if you're there or there abouts, it could all come down to that final game, which would be really exciting. So it's, it's an exciting time for the, for the women's team yeah. and for women's football in Scotland as well. Um, Paul, to finish off on, we usually have our predictions, which again, you picked me on again last week. Uh, by, by three points because you predicted that Barcelona Real Madrid score right 2-1 on Sunday night um, but being the international break and not as many much action I thought we'll have our own little break just really for myself to, to recover for a week uh, to then try and come back again stronger the week after um, so to finish on we've got a big good interview with Mikel Lustig who was in uh, on Friday here in the studio chatting to us about his Celtic career and about being back in Glasgow um, and it's all leading up to the event in May that they've got with Scott Brown at the Hydro which is going to be a brilliant night which tickets are still available for so definitely get your, your hands in some of those because that will be just a brilliant celebration for two players that didn't really get a chance to say goodbye properly to the football club. Yeah I think that was one of the obviously the you know a really difficult season and you know, Mika left the season before Scott Brown, but obviously, with you know, in the midst of the COVID, it meant that neither player was able to to play their last game here in front of fans. And I think even when he came in on the Friday to Celtic Park, I think it was quite emotional, mm -hmm. even just coming in to to see all of us and to do the interview with yourself, because it's obviously it was a big, big part of his life. You know, the the, the main part of his playing career, he was so successful, 
and his kids were born here and brought up here, so it's like a real part of the, their family life. And he had his, his two daughters on the pitch at half time with him um, on Saturday. And, you know, it was great. The, the reception he got was uh, superb. And I think, as you say, that event in May the 18th at the Hydro with him and Scott Brown and I'm sure various other guests will be popping in. It'll be a, a great Celtic night. But uh, he was, you know, he was a really great player for us at a, you know, a really crucial time when, you know, we were so successful. And, you know, you can tell he, you know, once a sell, always a sell. A hundred percent. Him more than more than most. So you get that. You get that feeling with. I think he just completely fell in love with the club. It's interesting, which you hear in an interview. Um, he did have his difficult moments at the club personally for him through injury when he first came in as well. He wasn't didn't hit the ground running, and he openly speaks about that. Where he says he had offers from other clubs, and he, he was thinking about it. Now, in retrospect, he's very, very happy that he made the decision that he did to stay at the football club and oh, just so many memories. And I kind of started the interview by saying, you know, you're remembered so much for the trophies that you've won and for some of the goals you've scored. But with him, it's actually more than that. It's because you see a player who was so committed to the jersey and to the cause and just fell in love with the club so much. That, that gives you so much more love for them as well. Yeah, and I think he embraced... I think when players come here and, and you, they embrace all the, the positive aspects of, of being at Celtic and, and, you know, they get that connection with the fans and the fans obviously love them, um, you know, particularly for some of his iconic celebrations over the years. <laughs> but I think by and large, you know, it's like if you and I went on the pitch, we, we could create an iconic, ce iconic celebration, but people would still think you're know, rubbish at football. <laughs> I think ultimately it's because he was a really good footballer and he helped us win and... You know, as I, you always think it's just a prerequisite, you give absolutely everything for the cause, but he absolutely did. And, you know, I think that's why he stayed for so long. It's why he became so close to people at like Scott Brown, because I think Scott Brown saw a kindred spirit of somebody he could rely on through thick and thin just to get stuck in and, and do what it, whatever it, it needed to be done to win for Celtic. Um, and he's just a good guy as well. He's a really, he was always great to deal with in all the years that, he was here with us, so I, I, no, I'm, a, I'm a big Michael Lustig fan, I have to say. Yeah, well, let's get to his interview now. Hopefully you enjoy hearing some of his old memories of being here at Celtic, and if you do enjoy them, then make sure you get your tickets for the, the event at the Hydro. But for now, thank you very much for listening this week. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Celtic View podcast on all of your podcast channels, and... Get a copy of the Celtic View. There's lots to, lots to plug here, lots to sell. Um, but yeah, for now, let's just finish on an interview with Mikael Lustig and we'll see you again next week. Hail, hail. Yes, everyone, welcome along to another episode of the Celtic View podcast. You can clearly see who is alongside us, but let's give him the big build-up. Anyway, over seven and a half years as a Celtic player, he created so many memories winning eight league titles, four Scottish Cups, four League Cups, playing in massive nights in Europe, scoring plenty of goals with plenty of celebrations. And we're really excited to sit here and look back on it all, not just remembered for your goals and the trophies, but also for the character that you were at Celtic and for your love and passion for this football club. I want to give you a big round of applause. Mika Lustig. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mika, how does it feel to be back in Glasgow and to be here at Celtic Park again? No, like a little bit surreal, to be honest. Uh, I just feel like a, like a tourist or supporter. I just like, oh, I want to go out on the pitch. Uh, let me see the dressing room and all, all, all of those things. But no, it's just, just amazing to be back, really. And uh, I can't wait to, to go to the game tomorrow as well and uh, yeah, see some old friends, so it's, it's good. Yeah, and we're here to also look ahead to a big night that you've got in May with our former captain, a man you know very well, Scott Brown. We'll get into that in a little bit. But just being back in Glasgow, it's the first time you've been here really since you left the club. Yeah, I was here in, in the Euros when we were playing with Sweden, but then was the, the COVID, so I couldn't, couldn't enjoy Glasgow that much. So, yeah, it's all, almost been four years. And, uh, yeah, since the day I left, I just... I just wanted to come back, really. So it's been a long, long, long four years, but you know, finally here. You must have had one thing when you're coming back to Glasgow. Obviously, the stadium and the people, but is there yeah. something you really wanted to to try again or to go and see again? Yeah, well, like my my me and my wife and my kids, we we went to the restaurant Bella Vita, go there to Mimo, <laughs> and uh, 
now we just can't wait to to go there tonight and uh, have his food and uh, i mean it's st paris right, day as well so maybe a couple of beers as well <laughs> yeah you can definitely <laughs> enjoy a few beers yeah, now you've not got a game yeah. to look forward to on saturday and coming back to the stadium as well What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you when you roll up in the car again and you see everything? No, it's just like, wow, a good stadium. <laughs> it's like, oh. You almost forget what yeah, it's like. it's like, oh, imagine to play there. <laughs> so now it's just, it's just good. Uh, well, some new faces, but yeah. a lot of old faces as well. And just, just, just so happy to, to, to see them again. Yeah, brilliant. And as we mentioned, we've got a big night to look forward to in May. It's May the 18th. A night with yourself and Scott Brown. Tell everybody about it. Uh, no, it's just gonna be good to come back to to be with Bruni, uh, to rely on Bruni once more, one more time. <laughs> so uh, no, I really looking forward to that. We, you know, play eight season together. Bruni was here for a, a long time, and uh, you know we got a, a lot of stories, a lot of memories together. So it's just gonna be amazing to to share that with uh, with the supporters. Are you having to get the notepad out to remember all the old stories again? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I need to start to, to think about that. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it's gonna just gonna be a, a good night. You know, a lot of good guests is gonna be there as well. I hope so. It's uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Keep a few guests up your sleeve for that big night. Yeah, exactly. But it's gonna be a brilliant occasion for yourself and Scott because. Neither of you really got a proper opportunity yeah. to say goodbye to the Celtic fans. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was yeah for for Bruni was the COVID right, and uh, now for me, I knew that it's gonna be my last couple of games, but the support didn't knew, knew that. Uh, so it was was yeah a little bit uh, tricky at the moment, a lot of emotions. Uh, so I am gonna be happy to to speak about that and you know tell tell all the people what happened and what my feelings uh, were uh, during that time. But uh, now it was just a strange feeling because when we play against Hearts in the, in the final, I knew this is going to be my last game. I put this top on. Uh, so uh, now uh, it was just strange that the support didn't knew, but I, I knew, so yeah, that's right. Yeah. Will you be more nervous for stepping out onto a stage than you were Going into a Champions League match and cup final? No, no, no. I, I, I love to be on the stage. I'm going to grab the mic and just sing oh, a yeah? song. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> I'm sure people will want to see a few about your dancing and yeah, things as well. We yeah, all remember that. It's going to be a lot of things. <laughs> but everyone can still get their tickets for it. Night with yourself and Scott Brown at the Hydro uh, in the 18th of May, I believe it is. It's going to be a brilliant occasion. So definitely get your tickets for that. Um, now, Mika. We want to go back through some of your, your yeah. Celtic career here, if that is yes. okay. And I want to go back all the way to the start because we remember so many of those big moments and memories which we'll get into. But take us back to, was it January 2012 when you signed? For, yeah, for yeah, I signed 20, uh, yeah, 2011, I think in November or something like that. But I still played in Rosenborg and then I need to wait for, yeah, for the January window to, mm -hmm. to come, yeah. What are your memories of coming into the club? Because Scott Brown just in an interview recently, did you see it? Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> Where he said uh, to the manager, who is this guy we brought in with the long uh, hair and the tattoos? <laughs> what a guy that was. To be honest. Uh, now, to be honest, uh, when I, uh, the last season with Rosenborg like, was finished in November and I just felt like, okay, I, I need a month off. Uh, but if I'm gonna go back, I, I, I would just go to Glasgow straight away to train one month with the, with the team and then I'm gonna be ready because I took a couple of weeks off and I thought like, yeah, I'm gonna go there in January, just, they're gonna build me up. But it was just like straight into training and obviously it's, it was better players, the, the tempo was, was higher. So I picked up a lot of injuries uh, at the beginning. So my first half a year was not good really i just i think i played like five games or so or so uh so when i came back to the summer actually uh sevilla was was asking for me if they they could buy me or loan me and uh, i felt like I, my start here wasn't the best so i, I was like ah, maybe I, I should go but i'm happy that neil lennon and and the staff just said no we we want him and then just ever since you know it was start to, to kick on my, my Celtic career. Yeah, that's a very good decision you've made in, in yeah. hindsight now. What are your kind of first memories of the, the people and the, the characters in that dressing room as well? You mentioned about 
the technical aspect of the players or yeah. some great players during that time, but also some of the characters as well? Well, obviously Bruni was was there. It was the captain. I was it was a lot of Scottish people. I mean, it was we had the the two Welshmen, Ads and, and Joe Ledley as well. So it was it was a really strong group. And uh, when I came back in Scandinavia, it's more like everyone is welcome. It doesn't matter if you're or if you're the star. Everyone just come together and uh, yeah, we just one big happy family. But here was like, okay, this is serious. If if you don't perform, you're out. And uh, I remember, like Bruni just told me the, <laughs> I think the my, probably my first or second training, I like dropped the ball a couple of times, and he's like, hey, you better get better <laughs> because otherwise you, you you are out here. So, uh, but you know, it took a while, and uh, you know, for me to have those those kind of uh, characters and players yeah. was just uh, perfect for me. Do you remember that you have an initiation to do when you you joined the club? No. Not really, no. no. I think you did. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, do you remember what you did? No. No, no. Okay. Do you? Do you? You heard something? No, no. no, I, just, no, no. I just saw you had a look in your face. No. Uh, you, no? Okay, okay. We'll, we'll move on from mm. that then. Um, yeah, that kind of first six months then when you when you came into the club, um, a little bit of a kind of slower start for you. Do you remember your debut? Yeah. Yeah, Aberdeen away. Yeah. Um, so then going into that next season and that summer, the 2012-2013 campaign, there were so many memories for it. For you personally, and also from the team, what do you think changed over that summer that, that helped you have that then career that you went on to have at Celtic? It's, it's just difficult to say. I, th I think like football is just a strange sport sometimes. If you just play one good game, you know, suddenly you, you're in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just knew it, I think, you know, Gary Parker was the assistant coach at, at the moment. Uh, so my first six months was not good, and he just told me. I think it's one of the first games in in that season. He just said like, "Okay, now it's time to perform. Otherwise, mm. it could be your last game." I was like, "Oh, thank you for that one." <laughs> <laughs> but you just think, and then you just do one good game, and then you start to feel more important, and you're a little bit more comfortable in your shoes, and, and then you just, I mean, especially the, the 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 team was really good at the moment as well. We have a really strong squad, obviously to. To make it to the Champions League uh, was was amazing, and yeah, what happened in in, in that group was just so many memories. So it was, mm -hmm. it was amazing. We'll chat about that Champions League campaign uh, in just a little moment. But your first goal against Hibs yeah. was that quite a big moment for you? Were you? Did you feel like you were starting to kind of get yourself properly established in the team at that point? Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you defender, you you're not like the first. Um, Main goal is to, to score goals, but obviously when you when you score a goal, uh, I think I might. Now I was involved in the second one as well, but mm -hmm. it, then you just feel like okay, now people maybe start talking about me a little bit more, and you like I said, you get, get more comfortable, and uh, yeah, it's always nice to score a goal, mm -hmm. if I'm honest. And then the Champions League campaign. Talk to us about the group is drawn. We have Barcelona, Spartak Moscow, and Benfica as well. It was a tough group. What were you What were you thinking beforehand? Uh, I don't know. You're just happy to be there. I think. I think we we sat at Lennox Town when they do the, the the draw, and everyone's just like, "Oh, Barca! <laughs> wow, this is gonna be amazing." Uh, and then I think my my first game was Benfica at home. I was yeah. playing centre half, and uh, uh, quite boring game. I think it was <laughs> end up zero zero. But now you just to. To have made my Champions League debut, and because everyone is talking about, ah, you like Celtic Park is good, but just wait till it's the European night is you're gonna be blown away. <laughs> when you just walk in, walking out there is just unbelievable, and I just think like Champions League, we have so much pressure in the league, in the Scottish league, to win the cups and to win the league, and actually go to the Champions League when you feel like now we play really good teams and the supporters just. Maybe not just happy that we're in, but it's just if we do a good game against Barca, even if we lose, people can be happy. So it's mm -hmm. like the pressure is taking off a little bit, and just to go out at Celtic Park, you don't have any pressure, just everything to win. When you make a tackle, it's like you're scoring a goal. It's just um, ah, it's, it's it's crazy. And then that next game away to Spartak Moscow was massive. Yeah. Was 
you get a nice assist in, in that yeah. game as well, don't you, for, for Gary Hooper? Because for Celtic, for all the great teams we've had in that recent history, we would yeah. never win away from home yeah. in the Champions League. How big a game was that, Samaras scoring in the last minute? No, oh, amazing. Of course, we, we knew that stats. I think we, we spoke of that before the game, that you know, a Celtic team never gone away from home and take all the three points. And we get a good start. And then I think, are they up 2-1? Yeah, that's yeah, right. They're yeah, they're up 2 1, and then I think Gary Hooper is on the way through, and they get a red card. And then just, we just, I think Samara scored the header, and Jamesy, uh, he get that goal. Yeah, it's we'll our own goal, him. but yeah, we <laughs> give it to Jamesy. No, but it's, it's just like one of those you sit there, like, oh, now we made history, like we, we finally did it. I think Celtic have been waiting for that away win for a long time and uh, to go to, to beat Spartak Moscow. and. You know, suddenly we got four points after, after two games and now we feel like, oh, okay, yeah. maybe we can do something good. Yeah, I can remember that because that game was earlier than the, the Barcelona game. They were playing later on that evening because the game was in, in Russia and it popped up the group table and it was like we were sitting top, top of the group. Of it. And everyone was like, <laughs> this is amazing. Surely this isn't going to last. And then it did and we managed to go through. The games against Barcelona, I mean, obviously the game at home, the 2-1 win, but to do that as well after the disappointment yeah, exactly. of conceding in the last yeah. minute at the new camp as well. I mean, just talk to us about those two games and your memories. Well, first of all, the away game, you go in there and like the first time at, at new camp, like the day before, you, you walk in out and you're like, oh, sh this is, this is <laughs> big. And like I said before, like away against Barcelona, it's not like, okay, boys, we at least one point. <laughs> it's not like that. It's just like, okay, go out. Just try survive. to survive. <laughs> yeah. I think they have a really good start as well. It's like, oh, this is gonna be tough. But then, then Sami scored, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a cross. And I remember, so we, we scored one nil. I think we they got a free kick. I look up at the big screen, and it's like Barcelona zero, Celtic one. But it's, they put my name instead, so they thought I scored. <laughs> so I was like, wow, this is amazing. Huh? <laughs> look, it's it's lustig. Oh, Someone must have a picture yeah, of that somewhere. Like, yeah, I was like, oh, <laughs> did I? Did I get a touch on it or something? <laughs> no, but it was, was amazing. And like you said, 1-1. One, one, I think they scored just before halftime. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. Um, but then we just yeah, tried to dig in. And the longer the, the clock went, they just like, oh, maybe we can do it. And then I think it's Sanchez who scored the, the goal. And they just, uh, it was just tough because like you felt if we would get a point away from Barcelona, that's going to be uh, amazing. Mm -hmm. So then you're th sitting there in the dressing room and you, you know you're going to play them in, in a couple of weeks and like, oh, it's never going to happen again, right? I mean, it's, it's Barcelona. They can't like almost lose to Celtic twice. It's never going to happen, but it happened. It did happen. Yeah. Leading up to that game as well, the 125th yeah, anniversary well, yeah. of the club. Just talk to us about what that was like as a player. You spoke about coming out to Celtic Park, the anthem, Champions League, but to do so with a display on that night, what was that like as a player? Now, first of all, I, for a couple of days before, I had, had a fever, so I was like, oh, I don't want to miss this game because I got my mates over and everything, so I didn't train and I was just felt really bad. Mm -hmm. But obviously, like you do everything to, to play that game. Uh, it's just like one of the, those games, you, you still see them popping up because we have no possessions. It's just, it was like 11% or something, like it never happened. I'm never going to happen uh, after that as well. But it was just those, like we, with Lenny, we worked a lot at set pieces. And we did the, the set pieces uh, the same day uh, as a game as well. So we knew exactly where Charlie going to put it and we know exactly what everyone else going to do and Victor is going to sneak on the, on, the, on the back post because they have George Alba there on the zone and he's, he's quite That's tiny. It's a mismatch. <laughs> it's a mismatch. So that was, uh, we, we, we scored a lot of goals uh, under him like with, with the set pieces. And then, uh, yeah, Tony was coming in from nowhere and uh, scored a 2-0 and then, uh, yeah, we, we did it. My memories of being at that game were just constantly watching Barcelona having the ball, yeah. looking at the clock to see how long it's gone. Oh, yeah. oh, it's only been a couple of seconds. Ah, yeah, what was it like playing in that? No, nah, the same. Yeah. Like every time, like, okay, now they have the ball, uh, unbelievable save by Fraser or like in the post or now it's a goal kick, you're looking up like, <laughs> like 30 seconds still, <laughs> and then you go again. And uh, I think we would play in a, in a back six, back seven, and it was just, 
like it's just like one of those as well like you just love it because like i said before if you do a tackle if you just pass the ball to a celtic <laughs> player it was like way <laughs> so that was amazing i remember like i think some is close to to getting through once uh, in in the first half and then just you, you get the hope up it's not even close but if, just because it's barcelona you just feel like every time you are on their pitch or get a set piece or corner you feel like now it can happen but that must have then given you the most euphoric feeling after that match when the full-time muscle goes no i think it was more like you're sitting there like wow what, what happened i remember the the day after i was just first in uh sitting there and then the, the gaffer just came in and didn't say much you just we look, look at each other just laughed like what what, what just happened because like sometimes you can feel that like this is going to be a game that we doesn't matter if it's going to be go five years or 10 years or 15 years this is going to be a game that we're gonna we're still talking about we're it. still talking about it and especially like we were celebrating the the like 125 years as well like all the, the stadium was was rocking and like the pictures uh, everything was just perfect yeah and then we qualified for the last 16 yeah. the game against spartak um you weren't on the pitch at the time with the penalty no yeah you got taken off at that point did you watch the penalty can remember the manager yeah no. had to turn no and then uh, then puff put it like crossbar and, and they're like <laughs> <laughs> everybody was worried yeah about it was crazy I, I think benfica was playing barcelona away as well and yeah. get a draw and they were like really close to win that game they have so many chances so if they win i think we go in third place with 10 points it's like it's unbelievable but now we managed to to go through and uh now it's just it's big yeah and just in, in general terms about the european nights we've spoken about the atmosphere but are they a lot of the moments then you obviously look back on during your time at Celtic that you you hold really close to you? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, it's it's no like I've never been in in a place as Celtic Park when it's a European night and when you play against a good team when everyone is just fired up. And I knew it before I came here because everyone was talking about it, but you feel like eh, it can't be that good but I've no, never been close after that as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's special. Yeah. Just to then kind of summarise in that couple of years then under Neil Lennon, what other memories stand out for you during that time? <sighs> Any memories of the manager? Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of... No, I, you know, I'm so grateful for, for the gaffer and Neil because... He, he was the manager who took me here, and he, he was a manager when I when I left as well. And uh, I didn't play that much uh, that my last season. But when he, he came in, he just said like, "Listen, you know, you know what uh, I feel about you, and uh, you you're my first choice." And uh, uh, for me, it was was really good because if I'm gonna have my last season to to be a little bit in and out, uh, didn't feel that good. But I'm I'm so grateful for everything he he done to me and. Uh, yeah, a lot of members. Uh, yeah, let's talk about some more big moments. Um, obviously, Neil Lennon leaves the club, Ronnie Dyla comes in, and then after that, Brendan Rodgers comes in, where we just have this unparalleled success of treble after treble. That summer period, what do you remember about Brendan coming into the club during that pre-season where you thought maybe, oh, this, is, this feels a little bit different, yeah. we can do something special here? Yeah, first of all, like... Ronnie was doing really well, at, like in because he didn't have the the same players that uh, Neil Lennon and uh, Brendan Rodgers had. Uh, but during his time, I, I was injured a lot, and those two years was just played a couple of games and then got injured, and I never like I didn't felt good to be honest. Uh, so when Brendan coming in, I was a little bit like, if it's gonna be the same couple of years like with, uh, with Ronnie, I'm going to struggle here because now now we just felt like we're going somewhere. But I just went back to doing the, the same things I did in back in Norway because when I played there I was never injured and like after that I probably played most most of the games and yeah, the he was so professional when he uh, coming in and I think the whole like whole Lennox town, all the players was just like okay, now it's the, the real deal, now it's time to get back on track to get back the supporters to Celtic Park to, to do something good and uh, yeah we did it. I think a lot of Celtic fans though after the first game 
against <laughs> Lincoln Red Hips away. I didn't play that game, that's why. Yeah, I exactly, I know. <laughs> I think if you said at that point, we're then going to go on and have an invincible treble, a lot oh of people would have thought, I bet oh, you're glad you didn't play in that oh game though. My God. No, it was crazy. It's just like, like I said, with, with Barcelona, after that game, you're just sitting like, oh, what did just happen? And that was the same feeling, but the other way. It's just like, Planes are going off in the background. Oh and... my God, we go into Gibraltar and playing against like firemen and, you know, <laughs> not even footballers. And then you come in the second leg and score and then we go on and... So you were the turning point, essentially. I don't want to say it know, on my own. But... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, that first season then, under Brendan, 2016-2017, League campaign begins. We are on absolute fire. It just continues throughout. Some of the big moments in it. We'll get to one five one game later on, but the first five one game in the, the Glasgow Derby. Again, I think you had an assist, didn't you, for for Dembele's hat trick? Was it your, uh, yep. yourself that chipped the ball over? Yep. What are your memories of of that game? Because that was the first game back for, for yeah. Rangers in, in the league as well. So the first derby in a while. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, same there. A lot of mates over. I think even the sun was uh, shining over Glasgow, <laughs> and uh, nah, just one of the, the those games that a lot of build up uh, the week before. It's like finally we're gonna play uh, against each other again, but you just felt straight away like we are we are too good. And uh, I think yeah, mo most of the games uh, games against them we we have that feeling like it's no chance that they 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 they're gonna win. Uh, but that game, yeah, we played really good and obviously when you get a couple of goals, it's, it's easier to play. And did anyone think we were going to do a 5-1 again? Well, we did later on in that season and it got it was capped off by the most incredible goal from yourself. Where does that one rank for you? Uh, no, probably one of the, the best goals I've scored. Uh, it was just good to, to see all their fans were, were leaving and, you know, <laughs> the back stand with all the Celtic supporters. Uh, I just love to play there, to be honest. Now it's a little bit different when they took away all the away fans and I can't know why, because that game is it's one of the best in the world and they just killed it, really. Because to, to walk out there during the warm-up and like to have the full Celtic supporters is crazy. But yeah, no, to, to, to score that goal it was, it was good. I want a step-by-step -step guide of what was going on through your head the moment that ball fell to you and then after it when you're going to celebrate because it seems like you didn't really know what you were doing with yourself. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Blackout. <laughs> Is that just one of those moments that you almost can't kind of remember? It just happened in a, in a blur? Or? Oh, come on, I just took the, the ball from my own <laughs> own half and scored it like I wonder. I've never done that before so <laughs> of course it's like, whoa, what happened? <laughs> that, um, that season then ends again in one of the most incredible fashions in the Scottish Cup final against Aberdeen, where Tom Roderick scores an in injury time to, to win the game. Again, another moment where being in the stand watching it is potentially one of the most nervous I've been yeah. watching a game of football. Were you the same in the park? Did yeah, you feel that, clear? Yeah. No, no, the same. Because it was a long time that we won the treble and everyone felt like I was... I won the double before, but never been really close to the treble. And you felt like this could be like one shot. You had like th this is going to be the moment when we have the chance to win it. And they scored the first goal, and you're just like, oh, come on, we can't lose against Aberdeen now. It was the same. Uh, but, had to be Johnny as well, didn't it? Yeah, yeah Johnny, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, to especially when, it, when it's Tom as well, like, like one of my favorites. Uh, to score that goal, uh, it was like, yeah, top three times like the most emotions game uh, I think I've played because my first treble with it's been a lot of talk like can can we do it, and then yeah we did it and especially love to to see Tom to to make that goal there was, was amazing and to do so as an invincible as well. What was it about that team under that manager at the time that allowed us to just be so dominant? No, I think with with the manager, uh, maybe a little bit like here now we have with with the Ange as well, but the supporters as well, like to never be satisfied. I think we have a really strong group, uh, a lot of good players that want to play, and you were never never just satisfied to to win a game. But if your performance was bad, you knew that someone else was knocking on the door. I think that season, I, I told the media that Callum McGregor was our 
most important player because he did he didn't start most of the games, but just to see his quality, the way he trained, and if someone was away from that starting eleven, he just coming in and w was yeah, likewise. So I think he he proved yeah, then and of course now as well, but then he just proved that he, he's a proper good player and so important for for a team. But uh, now we were never you're, you're satisfied. You just we just want to to break the records. You know? Yeah, I mean we could probably fill a podcast for about ten hours, Mika, with all the moments and all the memories. So we'll just run through a few more of them over those next couple of seasons. Well, actually, I want to ask what ones do do stand out? Maybe the double treble and obviously the, the last game, the treble treble, yeah. which we'll, we'll leave till the end. But anything else stand out? Uh, I think the the Karaganda game. Uh, because we we lost two nil, I think, yeah. away from home, and then you just had the feeling because that was a poor team. And we go into Kazakhstan and just um, we didn't like think we're gonna win for like, with like four or five nil, but we felt like okay, this is team that we we should have beat, and to to have that in the last playoff to reach Champions League, that's uh, that's really good, that's amazing. To lost that game two nil, to have like yeah. The pressure, because if you if you we wouldn't qualify that year. Hundred percent, I'm gonna say it here today. Like, oh, this is the the thing I regret the most. Mm. But to come here and and win three 0 that was was amazing. Do you want to hear the worst take that anyone's ever had in football? I remember the the away game. I think it might have been Virgil's debut, mm. and I think they scored a couple of goals from long throws. I remember saying Nick to my friends, like, this guy's never going to be good enough. <laughs> No, uh, that but, didn't work out no. from my point of view, but yeah. No, that, but, but it's good because I'm quite happy because Virgil, the Lena put Virgil on the bench, the the home game, and I played centre half. So I I always said like, and it was just a blame shot, which yeah, exactly. To, no, yeah, no. I see Sammy. I'm just gonna shoot, and Sammy's like, oh, let's oh so it wasn't no, shot, was no, it? No, no it was, uh, pass, yeah, you, you saw it in the corner of your no, eye, and yeah, you exactly. It the no, but it's good. So uh, I just put uh, yeah, one of the best centre half in the world on, on the bench to to make it through the Champions League. So that, that's good. Um, the double treble against Motherwell, the Scottish Cup final, um, it was a two 0 victory on, on the day, but more so the celebrations after it and having that bus parade. I think everyone remembers it. What are your memories? No, just like you need to pinch your arm, like wow, it's, this really happened. Good weather as well in Glasgow. Like just the bus from Hamden to Celtic Park, just have the Celtic supporters running next to us and you see the happiness. Ah, coming up here, you see all the people. Same there, like so many pictures. It's like, wow, this is, this is amazing because you, you don't get it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was crazy. And then to do it all again the following season, but that game, Scottish Cup final against Hearts, you mentioned at the start, you knew it was going to be yeah. your final game. It was obviously a massive game to do something that no one had done before to win a treble treble, so much external pressure on it. Take us then into the, the week for you personally, what that was like, knowing you had such a big game yeah. and then also knowing it was going to be your, your final match. Well, it's not just last week. I think the last couple of weeks or months, maybe, because it was like, my my two daughters is grown up here. They like the school, is the friends, like what we're gonna do with the house, and it was a little bit like I never closed the door on Celtic, so I just may, might have a little bit. Uh, maybe I could get a new contract. We we'll see what happened uh, because uh, Neil Lennon was a coach and he didn't know if you're gonna get a job. Or, so it's a lot of things like um, maybe or maybe not. So. But yeah, we just clear the house and yeah, that's take energy as well to just make sure that everything is sorted and, and things like that. And uh, yeah, just going through that game. It was special because against Aberdeen when we, when we won the league, I had a, uh, I went off the last couple of minutes because of my hamstring. And then I w wasn't able to play the last game here in Celtic Park because we had the cup final. So I was a little like, okay, it's my my hamstring is gonna be okay, and you think about that, and like you knew it's gonna be the last game. I don't wanna end up injured and maybe losing the game or things like that. So a lot of uh, like thoughts in in my mind. So like like I said before, like I felt in the warm up, oh my legs are they are heavy, <laughs> and I, I like yeah, the first four or five minutes, I just just poor, 
from my side and they score one nil and it's like oh my god it's gonna end up like that uh, but then Odson who step step forward oh because of you and nah, your headers today nah. as well come on. I mean you need to, <laughs> we're gonna give you the moment it was yeah, your, yeah, your last good. game as well but I mean it must have just been such a special but also such an emotional yeah no thing. no it was a lot of emotion because obviously my, my teammates knew that it's gonna be my last game as well and uh, I mean after the after the final whistle it's just like just happiness and you know sadness and it's just everything and you you came back to the to the dressing room and you sit there and you you're not sure if you're gonna cry or if you're gonna celebrate or it's just like so many things running through your head but I just like it took a time to get over but like now when I sit here like four years after I just felt like maybe it was the, the, the perfect uh, ending uh, so I'm so happy for all the love I, I I've been given after that so it's been amazing yeah it's amazing to sit back and, and go through it all and it's going to be amazing for the fans to yeah, hear more about it and the, the big night as well just to finish off what we always do in the podcast when we have someone on is yeah. go through some quick fire questions oh, okay. to learn a bit more about yourself and your teammates as well and there's a little, maybe some little snippets in there ahead Oof. of the, the big show for in, in May as well so uh, first up who was the who was the funniest player in the changing room during your time? And this can be someone that is cracking jokes or maybe yeah. playing practical. Ah, it's easy. Charlie Mulgrew. Yeah. Yeah. What a guy. <laughs> Anything come to mind? Uh, what what was it doing? Oh, uh-huh. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, just like banter all the time. Just a just a happy guy. Uh, was he the type of person you would have to be? cautious about being around in case you always think yeah. he's going to do something. Yeah, of course, of course. But it's just like good timing as well for, for the jokes. And no, nah, it, it was amazing. Yeah, brilliant. Um, <laughs> this is might be a, a tricky one, but if there's one player, if you're stuck in a desert island, you could be stuck with and not stuck with as well. So two separate players. Hmm. So maybe someone that would be a, can do stuff that would annoy you. And... <laughs> oh, there's a lot of them, huh? <laughs> I obviously need to go with my friends here because I don't want to like pick yeah, yeah, like yeah. like a random guy. It's like yeah. nah, I didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, nah, but I think uh, Tom Rogic, I, w- I would uh, go with him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So nice and chill. Nice and chill. He's from Australia. He knows the spiders. And <laughs> you know. Uh, no, nah, but you're just a clever guy as well. Yeah. He, he gonna figure out that we're gonna come from the island. Uh, <laughs> I love Jamesy, but I can't see him doing good things there over there. No, no. <laughs> like starting a fire and things like no, that. You know? No, 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 not a chance. <laughs> good chat though, like, but nah. Yeah. Nah. I go with Jamesy for that one. Go with Jamesy. Nice one. Um, what is a standout goal from yourself during your time at Celtic? There's been a, a few we've actually not not touched on. There was the Rangers one. The uh, which we spoke about the goal against Hearts as well. Yeah, but that that's not like my type of goal. <laughs> I think. Uh, no, well, in the box, maybe a a rebound or something like that. <laughs> You're not picking either the long range strikes, no. Oh, my my my, Your my favorite. favorite. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought it like a typical no, a no, typical no, no, goal. No. Okay, my favorite. Oh, <laughs> well, obviously the against the Rangers, it's. It's one of like the goals that I, I, I see most of the time, so I get tagged in and, and things like that. But okay, well we got help me help me here. Uh, uh, Hearts goal. Yeah, it's it's a good one, but it's it's not an important one. Um, a couple against Hibs and only. Couple. Yeah, I like to score against Hibs. Yeah, yeah. you done the wee celebration as well. Oh yeah, I scored twice in the semi final. Uh, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Don't <laughs> we we'll see that? Come out in the, the hydro, your little. Yeah. <laughs> all, 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 all of things. It's gonna come out there. <laughs> um, is there a favorite goal you saw from a, another player during your time? That could be like a strike or just a motion around mm. it. Um, actually, one when I left. Uh, if, can I take one of them? Go for it. Now, when when John Hayes score, uh, I think it's two 0 like, yeah, like yeah. the counter attack. It's just like the Irish boy. I, I just know how much it meant to, uh, yeah. for him, and I love Johnny. Uh, what a, like top top player and uh, amazing guy to have in the locker room. To to see him score that goal, yeah, pff, that was a good one. Nice one. That's good. Um, 
What was the, have you got any stories that maybe the angriest you saw a player or a manager maybe that, <laughs> in the changing room? Yeah, I, I had one with... A few uh, going on in there. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> we have one, uh, I think we played, uh, I think it's a semi-final or a final. We, we lost, I can't, it's maybe Kilmarnock or something. Mm. But it was a, the weather was bad. So it's like a lot of players were struggling to, to stay on, on their feet and we just coming in and... Uh, the manager was just like, take your shoes off and turn, like you see, I want to see your studs. So he's like, if you don't have those studs on, then you went, went, went through you. So uh, yeah, then uh, he, he was not happy at the time. Did you have the studs on? <laughs> yeah, always. now always, because as a defender, like if you don't have the studs on and if you do something yeah. like, but I, I actually, like when you train, I'd rather have the, what do you call them? Molds? Yeah, yeah. Molds yeah. on. Because you feel a little bit lighter and like a little bit more soft. So yeah. I can understand the offensive player that they won't have a good feeling. But as a, but as a defender, if you don't have the, the studs on and if you do the slip or something, then pff, it's not good. Nice one. And um, a favourite game? Is there one that stands out for you? <sighs> yeah, it's a lot of them. It's a lot of them. Yeah, it's a lot of them. <laughs> uh, Why don't you take it for like a favorite a favorite atmosphere or, or best atmosphere maybe you experienced yeah. and then another one for the for its importance. Now to play away from home in a, in a Glasgow derby was was good when you uh, like pumped them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was that was amazing. Uh, but yeah, well, I don't, I'm not sure. I think Spartak Moscow. If you go back to that game, yeah. I played. I think. That's a that's a period of time I, I was I was, was playing really good, uh, especially in the Champions League. So I can take that one. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, we'll leave it there because we don't want to give away all the stories no, exactly. for the the big day yeah. in May. Thank you so much for for yeah. coming in and joining us on the podcast. And I hope that you really enjoy your stay back in, in Glasgow yeah, again for this weekend. And everyone's looking forward to the night in May. I hope you are as well. So definitely get your tickets for it. But thank you so much for coming. Thank in. you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.